Welcome to a video where we're going to size some structural elements for what I'm going to call a slender slab building. We're going to start off by sizing bearing walls to resist the gravity load and then we'll talk about what we want to look at after that. A uh, tall slender slab building has the following definition in my world. The units extend from one broad facade of the building to the other broad facade, which is on the opposite side of the building, with no interruption by interior corridors. Daylight is harvested from both facades which means the units can be twice as deep as we would with a single-sided unit and they still get good daylighting. There is a view through both facades on the opposite sides of the unit which effectively accommodates 360 degree views of the surrounding environment. You get 180 degrees on one side and 180 degrees on the other side. It provides uh, excellent cross ventilation opportunities for both fresh air and ventilative cooling. And such a structure or such a unit is thermally very efficient because there's no heat loss or gain through the floor, ceiling, or side walls. The only uh, thermal gains and losses occur through the facade walls. So we're going to make the following initial assumptions. The bearing walls carry the gravity loads. This will simplify our initial calculations and give us a sense of what bearing walls can accomplish in a very tall building. We're going to assume the bearing walls are at least 8 inches thick for fire reasons and to keep buckling from being an overwhelming concern. Now, an 8 inch thick wall still has buckling issues and for the moment we're going to just ignore them because we're doing some calculations to give us a sense of the scale of things and we like to know in a really tall building how thick the bearing walls have to become. Um, in order to do their job to resist crushing of the material. And later on we'll get into issues of buckling of the bearing walls. Um, we're not going to talk about this in the first video, but we do want to make the point that if we size these bearing walls just to handle all the gravity loads, they are not going to be strong enough to handle gravity plus the overturning moment associated with wind or seismic effects. Furthermore, a plain flat bearing wall is not the ideal shape for the beam that resists overturning moment. We'd like that beam to look more like an I-beam and to have excess extra material rather at each end of the bearing wall. In other words, we'd like to have some flanges on it um, since they're vertical, they would typically be called columns, but in some sense they are a flange in an eye section uh, in the plan view of the building. Initially, we're going to assume the depth of the building is 40 feet from major facade to major facade. Um, in this case, I've shown uh, 40 here in the spreadsheet we're going to use and the 40 is in bold blue font and anywhere that occurs in the spreadsheet it should be understood that that's an input that can be changed by anyone who's using the spreadsheet as a template to explore some other uh, geometry. Initially we're going to assume the spacing of the bearing walls is 30 feet. In other words the units are 30 feet wide. The wall height is 10 feet high. The wall thickness, as we mentioned, is going to be assumed to be 8 inches. The floor thickness is about 8 inches, which we think we can span 30 feet with about 8 inches of concrete slab. That number may not be precise, but we have put it in there. And in fact, where it occurs in the spreadsheet, we're actually making it a formula 
where if this span uh, from bearing wall to bearing wall increases, this increases in proportion. Um, so in fact, that eight inch uh, should not have been put in in blue at this moment because it can be overridden, but right now there's a formula there that's a function of this span, 30 feet. And initially we're going to assume the density of the concrete is 150 pounds per cubic foot, which accounts for sort of an average amount of uh, steel reinforcement um, and heavy stone aggregate. So this is a plan view of the building. In this case, I'm just saying one of the major facades is facing north and one is facing south. We're not showing the actual facade here because we're focusing uh, on structure, but there'd be a facade along this line and a facade along that line. So these are the bearing walls right here. So along structural line A, B, C, and D, we've shown this eight inch thick bearing wall. And then we've shown a column at the end. The uh, width of the building is 40 feet. The span between units is 30 feet. So this bearing wall now becomes responsible for a swash of floor that goes halfway to the bearing wall along line A and halfway to the bearing wall along line C. In other words, it's responsible for a strip of floor which is 30 feet wide. Um, while we're on this image, I want you to note that there is a strip of floor that's been drawn in here that's an inch wide, uh, excuse me, a foot wide. Um, and that strip of floor can be thought of as a representative strip because, in fact, anywhere we draw it along here, we have essentially the same structural burden. So rather than run numbers for the entire slab, we're just asking how much does this strip of floor load this little patch of bearing wall. So we have a 30 foot wide uh, strip of material that's it's one foot wide and it spans 35 feet in this direction. And all the load on that eventually gets down on this patch that's one foot by the thickness of the wall, which in this case we're assuming to be eight inches. So these again are the assumptions that we've made and that we've discussed. And now we're going to talk about how they impact gravity loads. So P dead on the floor is um, 100 in this case. Uh, P live is 40 pounds a square foot. Now I'm going to jump to the spreadsheet, but I want you to notice that this 40 pounds is an input. Um, I'm not sure that we can vary that in any significant way because the codes prescribe that the live load for a building of this sort will be 40 pounds a square foot. But if we can find an argument for changing that, uh, this number is an input in the spreadsheet. So if I jump to our spreadsheet, here we see these numbers repeated that I just showed you in the PowerPoint and I'm going to click on this cell and I want you to notice that there's a formula that says B12 which is the floor thickness divided by 12 that's 12 inches so in other words we're converting this to a thickness in feet rather than in inches and then we multiply it times B13, which is the density. This is the classic formula that the height of a column of material multiplied times the density of that material gives you the pressure at the base. This is the origin of expressions like a certain piece of equipment that's used in diving is good down to 300 meters meaning it can stand the pressure of a 300 meter tall column of water on top of it. Uh, except in this case, we have an eight inch tall column of water. And to keep the units consistent, we converted that eight inches to two thirds of a foot 
because this density is in pounds per cubic foot and when we multiply times the floor thickness we want the foot to cancel out so we multiply by two-thirds of a foot and we get a hundred and that sort of intuitively makes sense a 12 inch thick slab would just create one cubic foot of material per every square foot of floor so it would weigh 150 pounds uh, something that's only eight inches thick weighs 100 pounds a square foot Again, we have this live load and there's no formula because that's an input that we get from the code. So now we're calculating the factored gravity load, which is the load factor for dead load, which is 1.2 times this 100 pounds per square foot. And then we have a 1.6 times P live, which is times the 40. And we have a formula here. So everything that's black is derived from a formula and everything that's blue is um, determined um, through a formula and for the moment by the way I'm going to convert this as I said to black and turn off the bold because the floor thickness has been sort of proportioned to be determined by whatever this span is. So you'll notice there's a factor of 8 thirds here times B9, where B9 is the spacing, and if we move those columns further apart, uh, we'll have a thicker slab. We have to be careful if we move those walls closer together, we may still keep a floor thickness of 8 inches, which will allow us to bury plumbing and electrical and all sorts of other things in that concrete slab. If we make that slab too thin, we won't be able to get the plumbing buried in it. Okay, so we have uh, gone through this point and we've found that the total factored gravity load on the floor is 184 pounds a square foot. Um, so now we want to know what's the pressure that that strip of material puts on the uh, wall. So you'll recall that that strip is 30 feet long. So if we multiply 30 feet times that pressure, that'll give us the total, or if we want to, one foot times 30 feet times that pressure gives us the total force. And then that total force is divided by whatever the area of the wall is. But we're just going to avoid dealing with this one foot and we're going to say this 30 feet of distributed load ends up focused in that 8 inch wide strip. So it's going from 30 feet to 8 inches. And so when we come back to our formula on the spreadsheet, we see that the factored gravity load on one of one floor slab on the wall is going to equal this load times 30 divided by V11. And this 30 actually should have been this number. In other words, um, we would like for this to be actively determined by whatever option was put in here. So I never should have written 30 in there. I sometimes see that 30 and then I type 30 in there and I'm supposed to make the cell active. So it's B18, which is this area distributed load, times this 30 feet divided by B11, which is the wall thickness. So we're just scaling it from 30 feet down to 8 inches. Uh, again, though, to keep it in consistent units, B11 is divided by 12 here to get that 8 inches into an equivalent number of feet, which is 0.6667 feet, or two-thirds of a foot. So we have this much area distributed over the floor. This is the area distributed when we narrow it down to pressing on the wall. Then we have a factored gravity load at the bottom of the wall that's attributed to the weight of the, of the wall itself. So for one story of wall, 
we have a formula here which is our load factor for gravity loads and then we have that times B10 which is the height of the wall times the density again and this is kind of cool because when we highlight this that's a formula up there but it's showing us up here what are the various things that are being grabbed in our formula so it's highlighting B10 and B13 and again this is the same formula we used before where we said the pressure at the bottom of a column of material in this case the bearing wall is the column is going to be the height of that column times the density of the material in that column so we have that formula and it comes down to 1800 so we have 8280 pounds per square foot associated with the load of the floor slab and the live load on that slab and then we have 1800 pounds per square foot which is the weight of the wall itself and when we add those two together we get this much pressure at the bottom of a single story that is the result of whatever floor that story is supporting plus the weight of the wall itself so we're now going to go through and we're going to say uh, what is the stress or pressure at the bottom of um, the tall wall which represents the full height of the building if we have a single story it's the 70 so let's just go see that's a 25 which is the number of stories times this number which is the pressure associated with the floor and the wall that's associated with that one story now when we go here it just goes b26 but you'll notice when i did this i filled in this formula and i said well i want it always to go back to cell b21 um, but I want it to update it according to the number of stories because if I have 10 times as many stories I have 10 times as much pressure because I have 10 times as much load that's being supported so I always want the first part of the formula to update but I don't want this part to update because I want it to always go back to cell B21 so to make that an absolute reference I've put in a dollar sign before the B and a dollar sign before the 21 which says don't ups update that cell so when I go here you'll notice that formula that part of the formula hasn't changed but the A26 has so I wrote this formula right there and then I grabbed all the elements in this column and I hit control D which means control down or fill down and it automatically put the formula in there so this is a really cool thing that I don't have to say well how many formulas do I how many stories do I want to consider I can just put in this formula and then I can fill my spreadsheet way down and um, and figure out what kinds of stress problems I have uh, as a function of how tall the building is now you'll notice there's one other thing in this formula this is I've divided by 144 here because this is in pounds per square foot but at some point when I'm thinking about concrete we we think of concrete as having yield stresses in the neighborhood of pounds per square inch like 5,000 pounds per square inch is is a common number and we tend to look at square inches of material whenever we're looking at internal stresses so I took whatever this pounds per square foot is and I divided that by 144 to give me the number of pounds per square inch so then I filled that formula down and by the way this right here makes this note so one of the things you got to be really careful of by the way is we jump back and forth between units like this which tend to be the units that we use for forces distributed on a floor like live load or the dead load of the floor we also use pounds per square foot 
uh, to characterize soil because soil is a relatively weak material. But when we get into the stronger materials like concrete and steel, we jump to pounds per square inch. So up here we were pounds per square foot, now we're pounds per square inch. And my formula was filled down till I got to right here. And I stopped right there for the following reason. Um, 5,000 PSI concrete is considered in Raleigh, North Carolina, sort of the high end of concrete that you, is readily available. In the, in the world of tall buildings, though, that's considered a really pretty poor quality concrete. Um, but that's the failure stress. And when we multiply that by 0 0.65, 0 0.65 is the resistance factor for concrete. Um, typically for steel, the resistance factor is 0 0.9. Uh, for concrete is 0 0.65 because we have less certainty about concrete. So when we multiply that times 5,000, we get 3,250 PSI which would be the stress level we'd have by the time we got to a 46-story floor building. So we can live with this 8-inch thick wall in terms of the crushing stress of this material with all the load and resistance factors accounted for. We can go up to 46 floors. If we wanted to go to 10,000 PSI concrete, we can go up to 92 floors. So... So, to summarize, we have assessed all the dead weights associated with these 8 inch thick slabs, with the 8 inch thick walls, and with the live loads on the floor, and we've factored all those. And then we've accounted for the um, resistance factors for the material, where even though it may crush at 5,000 psi, uh, we have to throttle back on that to 3,250, or it might fail at uh, crush at 10,000 PSI, but we have to throttle back to 6,500 to account for uncertainties in the material. Having accounted for all that, we've determined that we could go to a 92-story building. That's a 920-foot tall building with a floor every 10 feet and not exceed the capacity of this 8 inch thick bearing wall assuming we're using 10,000 psi concrete which is available in many of our major cities this is a pretty impressive piece of information the key thing to remember here still is we haven't accounted for buckling of the wall um, so probably we're not going to get to 92 stories and probably this wall is going to have to be thicker down near the base in order to avoid buckling issues. But nonetheless, we, we have a pretty profound sense of scale that comes out of this. Because we have these long distributed walls, um, the net area of those walls is actually pretty high and the capacity for carrying load is very high. So this is a very kind of sweet structural arrangement where the walls that we want to have for acoustic separation and fire separation are actually uh, able to handle the gravity loads for a very tall building, a building up in the neighborhood of uh, eight or 900 feet tall. So having done that now though, in this diagram by the way, this is sort of the summarizing issue. We've been looking at the upward pressure on the bottom of the bottom wall associated with all these cumulative loads up above. And we're now ready to think about other issues like the overturning moment associated with wind and eventually we'd also like to look at seismic effects. So this concludes our first video uh, dealing with structural sizing of slender slab buildings 
where we have sized the bearing wall to support the gravity loads. Next, we're going to put these columns at the end of the bearing walls and they will be integrated in with the bearing walls. But we're going to size these columns to deal with the overturning moment of wind. And then we're going to uh, think about how we handle issues like deflection. So initially we're going to size these columns for strength. And then we have to figure out how we're going to deal with the issue of deflection.